Chapter Five of Black Amazon of Mars by Lee Brackett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Five. They waited. Some distance away, a guard leaned against the parapet, huddled in his cloak. He glanced at them incuriously. It was bitterly cold. The wind came whistling down through the gates of death, and below in the streets the watchfires shuddered and flared. They waited, and still there was nothing. Balin said impatiently, "'How can you know they're coming?' Stark shivered, a shallow rippling of the flesh that had nothing to do with cold, and every muscle of his body came alive. Phobos plunged downward. The moonlight dimmed and changed, and the plain was very empty, very still. They will wait for darkness. They have an hour or so, between moon set and dawn. Thanis muttered, Dreams. Besides, I'm cold. She hesitated, and then crept in under Balin's cloak. Stark had gone away from her. She watched him sulkily where he leaned against the stone. He might have been part of it, as dark and unstirring. Demos sank low toward the west. Stark turned his head, drawn inevitably to look toward the cliffs above Kushat, soaring upward to blot out half the sky. Here, close under them, they seemed to tower outward in a curving mass, like the last wave of eternity rolling down, crested white with the ash of shattered worlds. I have stood beneath those cliffs before. I have felt them leaning down to crush me, and I have been afraid. He was still afraid. The mind that had poured its memories into that crystal lens had been dead a million years, but neither time nor death had dulled the terror that beset Ban Krushak in his journey through that nightmare pass. He looked into the black and narrow mouth of the gates of death, cleaving the scarp like a wound, and the primitive ape thing within him cringed and moaned, oppressed with a sudden sense of fate. He had come, painfully, across half a world, to crouch before the gates of death. Some evil magic had let him see forbidden things, had linked his mind to an unholy bond with the long-dead mind of one who had been half a god. These evil miracles had not been for nothing. He would not be allowed to go unscathed. He drew himself up sharply then and swore. He had left Inchaka behind, a naked boy running in a place of rocks and sun on Mercury. He had become Eric John Stark, a man and civilized. He thrust the senseless premonition from him and turned his back upon the mountains. Demos touched the horizon. A last gleam of reddish light tinged the snow and then was gone. Thanis, who was half asleep, said with sudden irritation, I do not believe in your barbarians. I'm going home. She thrust Balin aside and went away down the steps. The plain was now in utter darkness, under the faint northern stars. Stark settled himself against the parapet. There was a sort of timeless patience about him. Balin envied it. He would have liked to go with Thanis. He was cold and doubtful, but he stayed. Time passed. Endless minutes of it, lengthening into what seemed hours. Stark said, Can you hear them? No. They come. His hearing, far keener than Balin's, picked up the little sounds, the vast inchoate rustling of an army on the move in stealth and darkness. Light-armed men, hunters, used to stalking wild beasts in the snow. They could move softly, very softly. "'I hear nothing,' Balin said, and again they waited. The westering stars moved toward the horizon, and at length in the east a dim pallor crept across the sky. The plain was still shrouded in night, but now Stark could make out the high towers of the high city of Kushat, ghostly and indistinct. 
the ancient, proud high towers of the rulers and their nobles, set above the crowded quarters of merchants and artisans and thieves. He wondered who would be king in Kushat by the time this unrisen sun had set. "'You are wrong,' said Balin, peering. "'There is nothing on the plain.' Stark said, Wait. Swiftly now, in the thin air of Mars, the dawn came with a rush and a leap, flooding the world with harsh light. It flashed in cruel brilliance from sword blades, from spearheads, from helmets and burnished mail, from the war harness of beasts, glistened on bare russet heads and coats of leather, set the banners of the clans to burning, crimson and gold and green, bright against the snow. There was no sound, not a whisper in all the land. Somewhere a hunting horn sent forth one deep cry to split the morning. Then burst out the wild skirling of the mountain pipes and the broken thunder of drums, and a wordless scream of exultation that rang back from the wall of Kushat like the very voice of battle. The men of Mech began to move. Raggedly, slowly at first, then more swiftly, as the press of warriors broke and flowed, the barbarians swept toward the city as water sweeps over a broken dam. Knots and clumps of men, tall men running like deer, leaping, shouting, swinging their great brands. Riders spurring their mounts until they fled belly down, spears, axes, sword blades tossing, a sea of men and beasts, rushing, trampling, shaking the ground with the thunder of their going. And ahead of them all came a solitary figure in black mail, riding a raking beast trapped all in black, and bearing a sable axe. Kushat came to life. There was a swarming and a yelling in the streets, and soldiers began to pour up onto the wall. A thin company, Stark thought, and shook his head. Mobs of citizens choked the alleys, and every rooftop was full. A troop of nobles went by, brave in their bright mail, to take up their post in the square by the great gate. Balin said nothing, and Stark did not disturb his thoughts. From the look of him, they were dark indeed. Soldiers came and ordered them off the wall. They went back to their own roof, where they were joined by Thanis. She was in a high state of excitement, but unafraid. Let them attack, she said. Let them break their spears against the wall. They will crawl away again. Stark began to grow restless. Up in their high emplacements the big ballistas creaked and thrummed. The muted song of the bows became a wailing hum. Men fell and were kicked off the ledges by their fellows. The blood howl of the clans rang unceasingly on the frosty air, and Stark heard the rap of scaling ladders against stone. Thanis said abruptly, What is that? That sound like thunder. Rams, he answered, they are battering the gate. She listened, and Stark saw in her face the beginning of fear. It was a long fight. Stark watched it hungrily from the roof all that morning. The soldiers of Kushat did bravely and well, but they were as folded sheep against the tall killers of the mountains. By noon the officers were beating the quarters for men to replace the slain. Stark and Balin went up again onto the wall. The clans had suffered. Their dead lay in windrows under the wall, amid the broken ladders. But Stark knew his barbarians. They had sat restless and chafing in the valley for many days, and now the battle madness was on them, and they were not going to be stopped. Wave after wave of them rolled up and was cast back, and came on again relentlessly. The intermittent thunder boomed still from the gates, where sweating giants swung the rams under cover of their own bowmen. And everywhere, up and down through the forefront of the fighting, rode the man in black armor 
and wild cheering followed him. Balin said heavily, It is the end of Kushat. A ladder banged against the stones a few feet away. Men swarmed up the rungs, fierce-eyed clansmen with laughter in their mouths. Stark was first at the head. They had given him a spear. He spitted two men through with it and lost it, and a third man came leaping over the parapet. Stark received him into his arms. Balin watched. He saw the warrior go crashing back, sweeping his fellows off the ladder. He saw Stark's face. He heard the sounds and smelled the blood and sweat of war, and he was sick to the marrow of his bones, and his hatred for the barbarians was a terrible thing. Stark caught up a dead man's blade, and within ten minutes his arm was as red as a butcher's, and ever he watched the winged helm that went back and forth below, a standard to the clans. By mid-afternoon the barbarians had gained the wall in three places. They spread inward along the ledges, pouring up in a resistless tide, and the defenders broke. The rout became a panic. "'It's all over now,' Stark said. "'Find Thanis and hide her.' Balin let fall his sword. "'Give me the talesman,' he whispered, and Stark saw that he was weeping. "'Give it to me, and I will go beyond the gates of death, and rouse Ban Kushak from his sleep. And if he has forgotten Kushat, I will take his power into my own hands. I will fling wide the gates of death, and loose destruction on the men of Mech. Or if the legends are all lies, then I will die. He was like a man crazed. Give me the talesman. Stark slapped him, carefully and without heat, across the face. Get your sister, Balin. Hide her unless you would be uncle to a red-haired brat. He went then like a man who has been stunned. Screaming women with their children clogged the ways that led inward from the wall, and there was bloody work afoot on the rooftops and in the narrow alleys. The gate was holding still. Stark forced his way toward the square. The booths of the hucksters were overthrown, the wine jars broken and the red wine spilled. Beasts squealed and stamped, tired of their chafing harness, driven wild by the shouting and the smell of blood. The dead were heaped high where they had fallen from above. They were all soldiers here, clinging grimly to their last foothold. The deep song of the rams shook the very stones. The iron-sheathed timbers of the gate gave back an answering scream, and toward the end all other sounds grew hushed. The nobles came down slowly from the wall and mounted and sat waiting. There were fewer of them now. Their bright armor was dented and stained, and their faces had a pallor on them. One last hammer-stroke of the rams. With a bitter shriek, the weakened bolts tore out, and the great gate was broken through. The nobles of Kushat made their first and final charge. As soldiers they went up against the riders of Mech, and as soldiers they held them until they died. Those that were left were borne back into the square, caught as in the crest of an avalanche. And first through the gates came the winged battle-mask of the Lord Kiaran, and the sable axe that drank men's lives where it hewed. There was a beast with no rider to claim it, tugging at its head-rope. Stark swung onto the saddle-pad and cut it free. Where the press was thickest, a welter of struggling brutes and men fighting knee to knee, there was the man in black armor, riding like a god, magnificent, born to war. Stark's eyes shone with a strange cold light. He struck his heels hard into the scaly flanks. The beast plunged forward in and over and through, making the long sword sing. The beast was strong and frightened beyond fear. It bit and trampled, and Stark cut a path for them, and presently he shouted above the din, Ho oh, there, Kiaran! The black mask turned toward him. 
and the remembered voice spoke from behind the barred slot, joyously. The Wanderer, the Wild Man! Their two mounts shocked together. The axe came down in a whistling curve, and a red sword blade flashed to meet it. Swift, swift, a ringing clash of steel, and the blade was shattered and the axe fallen to the ground. Stark pressed in. Kiaran reached for his sword, but his hand was numbed by the force of that blow, and he was slow a split second. The hilt of Stark's weapon, still clutched in his own numbed grip, fetched him a stunning blow on the helm, so that the metal rang like a flawed bell. The Lord Kiaran reeled back, only for a moment, but long enough. Stark grasped the war-mask and ripped it off, and got his hands around the naked throat. He did not break that neck as he had planned, and the clansmen who had started in to save their leader stopped and did not move. Stark knew now why the Lord Kiaran had never shown his face. The throat he held was white and strong, and his hands around it were buried in a mane of red gold hair that fell down over the shirt of mail. A red mouth, passionate with fury, wonderful curving bone under sculptured flesh, eyes fierce and proud and tameless as the eyes of a young eagle, fire blue defying him, hating him. By the gods, said Stark very softly, by the eternal gods. End of chapter 5